Okay, Assalamualaikum and good day everyone. Alright, so this will be the next topic okay, for the precast concrete structure. Alright, so previously we have already covered on the frame analysis of the precast concrete structure. Alright, so as for uh, this topic, alright, okay, we are going to uh, go into the joints and connections in the precast structure system. Right, okay, so we know that uh, joints and connections okay, are very vital okay, in the uh, in a precast concrete structure. Okay, since we are going to use this okay, as the uh, main uh, connection okay, between uh, uh, for the assembly of the structures. Right. Okay, so for the topic outcomes, okay, at the end of this lesson, okay, you should be able to describe okay, and illustrate the connection system okay, of a precast concrete structure. Right, <clears throat> so um, earlier, okay, in the precast concrete system, right, it is uh, actually using in situ concrete joints, okay, whereas uh, it will be using the extended permanent bearings, bearings, right. So the disadvantage of this uh, method, okay, is that uh, it could uh, be subjected to shrinkage, okay, and also flexural. Tracking, right, key due to the precast to in situ interface, right. So this is the previous um, <coughs> technology okay, that has been used in the precast concrete design, right. So therefore, okay, for the new one, okay, we are not going to uh, use the in situ concrete joints anymore, right. Okay, so uh, these are examples okay, of the uh, connections, right. So here we have uh, the connection okay, between the slab okay, and also the beam. Okay, and also we have the connection okay, we, uh, up, uh, between the uh, column okay, and also the uh, uh, beam. Right? Okay, so we uh, can see here that it is actually uh, supporting each other. Right? So we have uh, the column uh, beam floor system. Right? So we have the double T slab. Okay, and then we also have the column okay, and also we have the inver inverted T beam. Right, so and this also, okay, here we can see that we have these uh, connections, right? So we have the connection to the beam here, okay, and also this is the hollow core slab, right? So we can see that we have the connection uh, from the slab to the beam, okay, and also we have the connection, okay, from the, uh, between the hollow core slab to each other, right? So this is also considered, okay, as the uh, connection or joints, okay, between the uh, structures. Okay, right, so uh, the purpose of having uh, these uh, joints and connections, okay, is that we have these individual precast units, okay, can be assembled to form the load-bearing structure, okay, so it will be transmitting forces, okay, between structural members, okay, under serviceability limit state and also ultimate limit state, okay, then it will also provide stability and robustness, okay, and also able to resist abnormal loads, okay, for example, we have fire, we have impact, explosion and also subsidence, okay, so how to form a connection, right, so we can use bolts, Okay, we can use welding okay, and we also can use grouting, right? So, these are all these three methods okay, that we can use to form a connection. Okay, right. So, now okay, we have these two terms okay, which are connections and also joints, right? So, these two terms okay, are actually uh, quite uh, slightly different, okay? So, for the precast concrete system, okay, we are going to have these two uh, discussed separately. Okay, right, so for the connections, okay, it is considering the total co construction, okay, which it always have a structural function, right? So we consider the connection as a whole, okay, between the uh, members, okay, then as for joints, okay, it is considered as the individual parts, okay, that form the connection, right? So this will be the um, uh, thing, okay, that will be, uh, contributing okay, to the connection, right? So, for example, a beam column situation, okay, whereas okay, we have the bearing joint, okay, which is between the precast beam and also the precast column, okay, and the assembly is completed okay, by the uh, use of in situ grout and etc. Right? So, this entire uh, construction okay, is known, uh, is uh, uh, considered as a connection. System, right, so it will consider the joint, okay, and also it is considered by the um, 
uh, method okay, of assembly, right? Okay, whether it is using in situ grout or it is using bolting and so on, right? So this is considered as a beam column connection, right? So it, it the these two terms is almost uh, similar actually, okay? Right, so as you can see here, this is one example okay, of a definition of join and connection. Right, so we can see here that at this point, okay, at this part, okay, we have the compression join. Right, so this is the part. Okay, so this is considered as a compression join. Right, while as for this top part, okay, it is considered as tension and shear joints. Right, so you can see that as for joints, okay, it is considering the uh, minor part of the um, a connection, right? Okay, so uh, here, okay, we are considering, okay, so those are the joints, right? So we have these three types of joints, okay? So one is considering the top part uh, of the uh, beam to column connection and as for the compression joint, okay, it is covering the uh, compression part, okay, of uh, which is the bottom part, uh, bearing part of the uh, connection, Right, so therefore, this whole system okay, is considered as the connection, right? Whereas it is considering the uh, tension joints, okay, and also the compression joint, right? So here you can see the difference, right? So between the joints, okay, which is particularly the uh, the small things that is considered in a, a connection, right? And the connection is the whole system, okay? Uh, so in this whole system also we have to consider the uh, column strength and stiffness right and also the beams or flexural strength and stiffness okay uh, and so on right okay so next part right so connections design right so here okay we have uh, in the connection design okay we are going to consider actions of forces Okay, which are in tension, okay, a shear, compression or moments, right? And we also have to consider the fire hazards, has accidental damage, effect of inaccurate uh, workmanship and also durability, right? So in the connections design, we have to consider all this, right? Okay, so uh, the transfer forces okay, between the precast concrete elements to obtain a structural interaction when the system uh, is loaded. Right, so uh, it must consider okay, the force path in a global view of the whole connection okay, and the adjacent structural members. Right, so as what we have discussed previously, okay, when we talk about a precast concrete member, right, uh, a precast concrete system, therefore we have to look into the overall view of the uh, structural system. Right, so similarly for the connection, right, so we have to look into okay, the behavior of the whole. Uh, structure okay, uh, before we can uh, design the connections okay right so these are the main features in the connection design right okay which are the standardization and simplicity okay the strength movement ductility durability fire resistance and also aesthetics okay right so first we look into standardization and simplicity right so, uh, usually we are going to use generic type of uh, connections, okay, which are welded, bolted or grouted connection throughout. Okay, so, and we are going to choose for the least number of pieces, right? So, basically, okay, we are not going to go into a very complicated uh, connection, okay, whereas it has to actually be practical on site, right? Okay, whereas it is easy for the... Uh, Layman okay, or the construction workers okay, to actually apply okay, these connections, right? So there is no use okay, if this connection is very complicated okay, and it is uh, uh, not be able to be accomplished uh, perfectly on site, right? Okay. So then another one is a strength. Okay, it has to have uh, adequate uh, strength okay, to resist the subjected uh, forces okay, throughout the lifetime of the structure. Okay, and it has to be permanent. Okay, uh, it has to consider permanent imposed loads. Okay, wind, earthquake, okay, uh, soil and water pressure. Okay, and the volume changes in the precast components of forces is required to uh, maintain stability. Right. Okay, then the next one is movement or influence of uh, volume changes. Right. So we also have to consider the shortening effects of creep, shrinkage, and temperature reductions. 
Okay, which could also cause tensile stresses in the precast component and the connections, right? So at uh, these parts, okay, also we have to consider these movements as well. Okay, so if the connections restrain movements, okay, result, it will result in stresses that has to be considered in design, right? So we know that okay, when we have connections okay, that uh, restrain this movement, okay, actually we are going to induce moments to that particular connection right so we need to uh, consider this as well right so usually that is why for a precast concrete structure usually we are using the uh, pin joint connection right okay so the next one here okay, is the ductility okay, whereas uh, we have to consider the ability to undergo large deformation without failure right so it has to be quite flexible okay in order to uh, uh, cater for these deformations okay so it should avoid highly localized stress concentrations okay provide ductile reinforcement along lo load path okay and uh, provide additional strength capacity to potentially brittle parts okay the next one is durability right so the connections okay, should be designed and constructed to give Similar environmental protection as the elements con connected, right? So this is similar to the uh, precast concrete component itself, okay? Or it is uh, the RC component, right? Okay, whereas we have to consider the cover to the uh, structure, okay? So this is actually crucial, okay, in order to prevent, okay, this uh, corrosion, for example, okay, which is due to the environmental effect, right? So we need to have proper protection, okay, or a proper material okay, that is used for that particular connection right so instead of just uh, protecting the reinforcement that is in the uh, in the elements okay, we also have to consider uh, the protection okay, towards the uh, connection okay then the next one okay, is fire resistance okay so uh, these connections okay, might be weakened by fire uh, that is weakened by fire can jeopardize the uh, structural stability Right, so it should be protected with the same resistance as the structural frame. Right, so this is also similar. Right, whereas usually we are going to have this covers. Okay, right. Then uh, the next one is aesthetics. Okay, so unhidden connections can be either emphasized, okay, and uh, become a part of architecture. Right, so all finish as a functional but not expressive member. So no advantage is used uh, in using more complicated hidden connection, right? So this is for the aesthetics, right? So we have to consider this as well, right? Uh, however, usually we are not going to go for uh, a hidden connection, right? Okay, that is very complicated, right? So there is no use of uh, using a very complicated one, okay? Because it will not be uh, it will not be practical on site, okay? Right, so these are the connection and joints uh, design criteria, okay, which are ductile, okay, economical, okay, then uh, it has to be uh, good in, the in terms of the uh, structural behavior, okay, and also it has to be good in the final appearance. Okay, right, so as for ductile, right, so it can uh, resist ultimate design loads in a ductile manner, right, then it can be manufactured economically. Right and uh, erected fast and safety uh, and safely. Right then, uh, as for the structural behavior, right, the manufacturing and site erection tolerances should not affect the intended structural behavior. Right, so uh, the connection that we are designing okay, should should actually uh, should uh, correctly uh, attend okay, all the uh, intended structural behavior okay, for our whole structure. Okay, then it should also satisfy the visual fire and environmental requirements. Okay, right. So uh, here, okay, listed here are the <coughs> examples okay, of connections and also joints. Right. So as for connections, okay, we have beam to slab connection, we have beam to column, wall to frame, uh, slab to slab, slabs to staircase, uh, structural steelwork, okay, in situ concrete, timber and masonry pre uh, and masonry to precast concrete components. Right? So um, this can be using uh, either pin jointed connection okay, or it can also be using the moment resisting connections. Right? So as you can see here when we talk about connections, okay, it is talking about the system as a whole. Right? 
Okay, then as for the joints, right? So it will be uh, a smaller part, k okay, of the connection. Okay, whereas we have uh, a few a uh, few types of uh, joints. Okay, we have compression joints, we have tensile joints, we have shear joints, and also we have flexural and torsional joints. Right. So as for these joints, okay, it can be made by doweling and securing with in situ concrete or or grout. Right. So this is a uh, doweling. Okay, whereas we are going to provide the dowel bars. Okay, then we also have uh, the method where we have welding and bolting. Right, and also uh, using resin anchors. Okay, in combination of the above. Right. Okay, so we can use either one of this. Right. So we can see here now we can already see. Okay, the difference between these two terms, okay, the connections, okay, and also the joints. Okay, right, so first, okay, we look into the uh, first uh, type of joints, okay, which is the compression joint, right? So, uh, compression is transmitted, okay, between components by direct bearing or through an intermediate medium, right? So, in situ mortar or concrete. Right, so this is depending on tolerances and importance of accuracy okay, of the load transfer location. Right, so it is actually depending on the location of the joints. Okay, so for example, vertical load transfer okay, between two columns, okay, one above another, that requires concentricity between member axes. Okay, so this will provide intermediate medium of reasonable size. Right? So, direct contact without intermediate padding material is only permitted according to this clause. Right? So, uh, as we can see here, when we have this compression joint, okay, we need to have this padding material okay, or the uh, bearing pad. Okay, uh, but, it is only uh, uh, permitted. Right? So, direct contact is only permitted. Right? So, this direct contact means that we are going to have the precast component, compo uh, concrete component right under uh, 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 not under right so precast concrete component to precast concrete component is connected uh, without any uh, 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 padding right okay so kita letak je dia together right okay so uh, it is only permitted okay, where great accuracy in manufacturing and installation okay, with the bearing stresses of less than 0 0.2 FCK of the weaker concrete. Right? So, and only parts with uh, solid, okay, com uh, with solid uh, compression, uh, compression joint analysis, okay, or only parts with solid okay, that can use this uh, compression joint analysis okay, where HCS can be considered if ends are concreted solid, right? So this is uh, this direct contact okay, can only be considered okay, if okay, the ends are solid. Okay, however, okay, if it is not solid okay, with the hollow, okay, then it cannot be considered okay, with this direct contact, right? Then we also have to pay attention on this convex surface, right? So convex surface, okay, whereas we have uh, such as uh, this curve, Right. Okay. So when we have the uh, connection, okay, between the elements, okay, and we have this, uh, such as this uh, surface, okay, whereas we are going to have this contact width, okay, that is that might be very small, right? So instead of it is having a square surface, right? So uh, we I try to draw, right? So if uh, instead of having a square surface, okay, whereas the contact width will be uh, this total width, okay, however, it is convex, okay, which is like this one, right, so therefore, as for this one, the contact surface will only be this part, right, so this is also very uh, important to take into consideration, right, okay, so we have to consider, uh, we have to make sure, okay, that as for our structure, okay, our precast concrete element, it has to be properly uh, done, okay, especially at the uh, connections okay, to avoid this convex surface. Okay, right. So uh, the minimum dimension okay, for the contact okay, between the precast elements. Okay, so uh, the minimum minimum dimension okay, should be uh, at least fifty mm okay, for direct contact area, right, or seventy five mm okay, if the, the uh, diameter of aggregates okay, is. Uh, uh, 20 millimeters. Okay, so the minimum contact area is depending on the stress magnitude, right? So it is uh, recommended okay, to have uh, at least 8,000 to uh, 
uh, 12,000 millimeter square. Right, so this is the contact area and this is the dimension. Right, so the irregular surfaces, okay, use uh, joint uh, for irregular surfaces. Okay, we are going to use joint uh, bedding materials, okay, to avoid damage to contact surfaces. Right, so this joint bedding materials, okay, are the um, uh, non -cement cementation material, okay, that is placed, okay, at the contact surface. Right, so we can use either, okay, in situ mortar. Okay, or we can also use the neoprene bearing pads, right? So, this neoprene uh, bearing pads, okay, it lo looks almost like a rubber, right? So, it is used okay, at the contact surface. Right, then as for the uh, thickness, okay, it should be as small as possible, okay, without impeding the normal tolerances, okay? So, it is, uh, it is recommended, okay, to be around 10 to 15 millimeters, right? So, it should not be more than that, okay, in terms of the uh, thickness of this joint bedding material, right? So, beaded bearing, okay, usually is unreinforced, right? So, usually we do not have any reinforcements in that. So, the mode of failure, okay, the crushing of mortar, splitting of uh, precast components uh, in, uh, in contact with it, right? So, uh, this is uh, the mode of failure at the uh, joints, right? So we can see here these are the examples okay, uh, whereas we have the stress control contours okay, through mediums of different stiffness and sizes. Right? So we can see here that we have this compression joint right, that is in the middle here. Right? So as for this uh, example, okay, we have the infill material having lower elastic modulus than the elements. Therefore, what is happening here okay, is that uh, it is going to experience this tensile splitting crack, right? Okay, whereas we can see that the stress contours okay, dilate to cause lateral tension, right? So we can see here when the infill material is having a lower elastic modulus, right? So it will expand more, right? So therefore, okay, the compressive stress okay, cannot be directly uh, transferred okay, to the infill material. Right, then uh, the second one okay, is uh, infill has greater uh, elastic modulus than precast, right? So as for this one, okay, is uh, the elastic modulus, right? So uh, higher elastic modulus, right? So we can see that uh, it can actually uh, uh, cause okay, the stress contours okay, uh, at the local lateral compression right here. So uh, there is a possibility of localized crushing okay, happening here. Okay, due to this infill material. Okay, but if, uh, if we are providing the infill material that has the same elastic modulus and strength as the, as the precast units, okay, so therefore, okay, the stress trajectories is undisturbed by the infill media. Right? Okay, so you can see here okay, that this uh, stress uh, contours, okay, uh, this stress can be transferred um, uh, straight okay, to the uh, uh, other um, element, right? Okay, so due to the uh, good uh, infill material. Okay, right, so that is for the compression joints, okay? Then the next one is for the tension joints, okay? So as for this one, okay, lapping of uh, lead reinforcement bars or loops to connect precast members, okay, and uh, precast units, okay, have uh, projecting bars, okay, which are embedded in situ after casting, right, okay, so uh, usually we are going to have the starter bars, okay, which is embedded, okay, then we are going to apply the same rule as in situ concrete for a full encouraged length, right, so as for this uh, tension joints, okay, usually we are going to consider uh, the same um, uh, concept, okay, as uh, for are providing the encourage okay, for a, a cast in situ concrete, right? So thus, in precast, uh, projecting bars are usually hooked a full uh, 180 degrees to avoid lap becomes unacceptably large, right? So this is uh, similar to uh, the uh, concrete uh, uh, reinforced concrete structure, okay, whereas we are going to have this a uh, full 20, uh, 180 uh, hook. Right, okay, so it is actually here, right, okay, whereas, okay, we have the tension joint that is using the direct lapping loops, right, okay, so we have this loops, okay, that is moving, okay, in this direction, 
Okay, right? So that is the loop, right? So similarly for this direction, right? So this is the loop, right? So uh, we do not want K okay, to have the lap, okay? That is a very large. Okay, right? So in vertical lapping, right? Pressurized grout is inserted through hole, uh, through the hole K beneath to ensure full bonding of steels, uh, steel bars and concrete right so we can see in this uh, figure right okay, whereas uh, in the in this vertical lapping right so we are going to provide okay, this grouting as well here right so as for the grouting okay we are going to have this vent hole right so this is the procedure okay, to uh, apply uh, the grout right okay, whereas we are going to flush uh, first with clean water to clean any debris inside the hole uh, before grouting Okay, then we will be using the non-shrinking grout and uh, which is flowable. Okay, and um, it is actually using the two uh, two to one uh, sand uh, sand cement mix. Okay, of twenty hours, the twenty four hours strength of sixteen newton per millimeter square. Okay, then uh, for twenty eight days a strength of uh, fifteen newton per millimeter square. Right, so we are going to usually use the high strength grout. Right, so we can see here okay, that this is the um, uh, connection, right? Okay, whereas at the vertical lapping, right, we are going to have this graph. Okay. Okay, so uh, bolting, right? Okay, so uh, this is for the uh, type of uh, method okay, that will be used in the connections, okay, in the joints, as joints. Okay, so this first one, okay, we have a bolting, right? So bolting is used extensively to transfer a tensile and shear forces. Okay, where the yield strength of bolt must govern the tensile capacity of bolted connections, okay, to give ductile failure, right? So as for this bolting, right? So it is actually, um, uh, we are going to go into the calculations, okay? So similarly as uh, we are dealing with a steel structure. Right, so we need to calculate okay, the number of bolts that is required okay, and also the strength of bolts that we are using. Right, so the shear capacity is governed by local bearing strength of the concrete okay, and also the shank of the threaded bolt. Right, so shear bolt failures are brittle. Right, so therefore, okay, we wanted to avoid this failure from happening. Right, okay, so uh, in using bolts, okay, we need to consider the number of uh, bolts that we will be using as well. Okay, right, then uh, we also have another type uh, of method which is welding. Right, so uh, welding connected um, through projecting bars, okay, directly between bars or indirectly using intermediate bar or plate. Right, so it can be uh, connecting uh, the two bars together, okay, or we can also. Uh, use uh, an additional uh, bar okay, or plate okay, to connect the um, uh, connections together. Right. Then we also have post tensioning. Right. So it may also be uh, applied okay, as tension joint. Right. Okay, whereas uh, we have as clamping a force across the joint okay, to resist tension and also shear forces. Okay. Right. So. Uh, that is for the method, right? Then next we move on to the shear joints. Okay, so for shear joints, okay, it will take uh, the action okay, in combination with direct or flexural compression. Okay, it is never considered in the presence of tension. Okay, so it occurs usually between panels of significantly large surface area. Okay, for example, floor units, horizontal diaphragms, okay, walls and shear walls. Okay. So this is uh, actually usually uh, using for the flooring units. So it also occurs key okay, between precast elements okay, and cast in situ infill or topping, right? So for example, if we are dealing with composite floor or beam, okay. So shear forces may be transferred in the following method, right? Which are shear adhesion and bonding, shear friction, shear keys, dowel action, okay, and also mechanical shear devices, right? So uh, we can use either one of this. So shear adhesion and bonding. So adhesive uh, adhesive uh, bond develops in tiny crevices okay, and pores in mature concrete. So in fresh cement paste between cast in situ concrete okay, and also the precast uh, concrete 
surfaces. Okay, right. So this is for the shear adhesion and bonding okay, between the material. Okay, then another one is shear friction, right? So uh, shear friction, okay, it relies on the nature of interface okay, between the contact surfaces, right? So if we have uh, cast in situ and precast concrete that is combined together, right? So therefore, it, it is actually depending on this surface, right? So this surface of uh, this contact surface, right? So here, okay, we are going to have this shear shearing happening okay, between these two materials, right? So we can see here, um, uh, as for this one, okay, so this is the friction, right? So this actually can be determined based on the uh, based on the uh, surfaces, okay, whether it is a rough surface, okay, or it is a um, uh, what a smooth surface, okay, between the uh, uh, materials, okay. Right, then another one is shear key, right, which is also known as castellated joints, okay, it relies on mecha mechanical interlock and development of confined uh, diagonal compressive strut across the shear plane, right, so the minimum length of key, key should be at least 40 mm, okay, with a root depth of um, uh, larger than 10 mm, 10 mm, okay, and also the uh, length uh, depth, uh, length to depth ratio, okay, of less or equal to 8. Right, so we can see here, okay, that we have uh, this in situ infill, okay, and we have the precast component, right. So therefore, this is considered as the uh, shear key, right. Okay, then uh, also here, right. So usually we have the shear, shear keys, okay, that is in between the um, uh, slabs, okay, okay, whereas we have uh, the connection, okay, between the holocaust slab, for example, right. So therefore, that is considered as the shear key. Okay, then we also have dowel action, right? So in cases of dowel, okay, when we are using dowel bars, right? So reinforcing bars, bolt or studs, okay, placed across joints. Okay, therefore, uh, here, okay, the shear friction and shear key effects are ignored, right? So the dowel is loaded, okay, by a shear force acting in the concrete, right? So uh, we have this perpendicular uh, dowel bar, okay, or we have this inclined dowel, Bar, right, so at this point uh, here, okay, if we are providing this lower bar, right, so therefore we are going to consider, okay, uh, this uh, dowel to resist the uh, shear forces. Okay, right, so this is one example of failure. Okay, so which uh, uh, showing a local concrete crushing okay, in front of dowel. Right, okay, so uh, this is one uh, example of a. Uh, dowel bar failure. Okay, then we also have mechanical shear devices, right? So there are certain uh, structures okay, that is using these mechanical shear devices, okay, especially between uh, the, the the slabs. Okay, so mechanical shear joints okay, is to transfer the shear. Okay, it is uh, achieved by side welding embedded plates or by tightly clamping okay, using friction grip bolts. Okay, uh, the most commonly used is welded bar or plate. Right? So as for this one, okay, if you still remember in uh, the Holocaust lab, uh, in the double T slab construction okay, that we have watched uh, uh, previously okay, in the video. Right? Okay, so we can see that uh, it is uh, fixing this uh, mechanical shear devices, okay, which is the uh, connection between the slabs, okay, right, so, um, okay, so these are the examples, okay, okay, right, so as for this uh, video, right, so we are going to stop here, so for the next uh, video, okay, we are going to look into the flexural and torsional joints, Okay, so with that, thank you.